Well, good morning. It's Friday, and I don't know about you, but I think we've all, uh, we are all ready for a little bit of the weekend. I think we are all ready um, after what the football teams locally did last week. I think we're probably all ready for a little bit of football. So it's great to have you here. We're always glad to talk about Jesus and to get your day started out right with Jesus. And I've really learned some things in First and Second Peter, and, and a couple of the things that I've learned is, man, there's there's a lot of good stuff in here that I can understand. I mean, let's be honest. We're, we're probably going to go to the book of Revelation next. I think that's the way that things are pointing. And uh, there's going to be things in Revelation that I'm going to have to say, you know, this is what I've been taught, and I don't know, right? Uh, <clears throat> but Peter, <clears throat> Peter's making this thing to where we can all understand it. So, Biff Yeager, it's great to see you, and um, we're always glad to be here with you. And one of the things about having it'll be good is when you don't get to hang out with Biff like you would if he was in Cleveland or Wellington, um, but, uh, there'll be a day when, uh, we'll be sitting there on the big pier watching Biff catch in big monsters out there on the ocean. So it's all great. We're glad to have you here. Karen Midkiff, Tony Smith. Great to have you guys here. We hope you have a wonderful weekend. There's Myrtle. Good to see Myrtle out of Circleville, Ohio today. Uh, <clears throat> we will just march right along out of this second Peter. It's very good stuff. Um, let's see, where did we leave this thing? Um, I think that what we did yesterday, uh, we talked about the false teachers and we've got to really be careful of, of that. Where am I going to encounter these folks? Generally, it's probably going to be in a, in a church, right? Um, generally the devil's the only one that never misses church, Right. And why is that? Because he's there to discourage you. He's there to get you in an argument over what color the new carpet's going to be. He's there to get you in a fight over what, you know, what missions are we going to support? And who's going to be the Sunday school superintendent? Who's going to teach the adult class? And who's going to teach? And we bring all the craziness from the world right into the church, and it makes it makes it very difficult. So, Maureen, great to see you this morning. It's good to see everybody. Uh, let's try... Let's see, false teachers. Um, let me read this to you because this was a good footnote. It said, false teachers are polemically, poly I can't even pronounce that, described as cursed children, literally, literally children of a curse, wells without water, unable to satisfy the spiritual thirst of men and clouds that are blown about by every wind of doctrine. So, Far, false teachers are further called servants of corruption because despite their profession of salvation, they have become entangled in the world and they've been overcome by the things of the world. Hey, I'm a preacher and I'm doing pretty good and people start to brag on me. And and once again, some people go the exact opposite on this. You just can't tell them they did a good job because, oh, they spend 30 minutes telling you how none are good, no, not one. And it's like, man, I was just trying to encourage you, right? But there are a bunch of people that when you tell them, hey, man, great job, after so many times they start saying, you know what, that was a good job. And you know what, the church needs to give me a raise. You know what, a church probably needs to provide for my housing. Well, you know what, the church needs to buy me a new car, you know. And that's how this thing progresses. So have to be really careful uh, with that. Uh, see, let's see. But uh, they were rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. Now, what's what's he talking about here? How many times do you see the word dumb ass in the Bible? <clears throat> not many, not as nearly probably as many times as we should see it, right? But uh, uh, in all honesty, it is in Second Peter chapter two, verse sixteen, and what were number? Uh, it's numbers or B or out of the book of Numbers twenty two five is where he draws that from, and he talks about God's power being so immense um, that God can He has all the power to do whatever He wants to do, and if you start talking and, and doing the wrong thing for God, there's going to be a curse. You're going to be cursed for it. You're going to get tangled up in things, and you may have had no intentions whatsoever. 
to get tangled up in this stuff. Then you're going to look back at this three or four, five, 10, 20 years later, and you're going to say, man, I really did something terrible here. For example, there's people out there that have added a book to the Bible. That's going to be a bad situation. Well, it's already been a bad situation because those people that did that are long gone, right? So you really have to be careful. You have to be careful adding anything to this. You have to be careful taking other people's words for something. Get in this Bible and understand what Jesus wants you to know. And that's what the doctrinal footnotes are about. That's what we're trying to do is get you to say, hey, turn to page, you know, what is this? Page 2018, okay? Turn here, read this. This is what the King James Study Bible says about such and such. Benita, it's good to see you this morning. So, unwilling that any would perish. Chapter 3 of Second Peter. The second epistle, Beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. And again, what's Peter starting out with? I just want you to remember. I just want you to think back. And see, you and I probably as Christians, we're probably not as on fire for the Lord as we were the day we got saved. So what gets me pumped up? What gets me rejuvenated? What gets me back to where I need to be for the Lord? Right here it is, okay? The thing that gets me back there is when I take a look at all the things Jesus has done for me. The fact that I'm 2,000 pages into this book, right? And I have a little bit of an understanding, but there's so much more we could understand. Now, do I understand enough to get me to heaven? Absolutely, because I've read the promises of God, right? That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the whosoever's of the world are you and me, because that's what we are, right? So we can do this thing. Uh, let's see, what have I got now? So uh, I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So I want you to know these things. Excuse me. I want you to see them. I want you to know about them. I want you to read about them. And this is what's going to happen. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days. Uh-oh, something's coming in the last days. What's Peter warning us about? They're scoffers walking after their own lusts. Scoffers are people who mock God. And I told you I was playing golf a few weeks ago with my college baseball team. We had a little alumni baseball get together and play a little bit of golf. Uh, went and got dinner a couple times together, and one guy just kept making fun of Jesus, making fun of me a little bit because, you know, I was a Christian. And I thought, you know, I really, the old Brooke Lunsford would like to just flatten this guy out and say, this is it, you know, you're going to hell, you're making fun of God, you're a mocker of God, and you're doing things according to your will, and one day God's going to knock you down. He may take you out of here and put you in hell. But I thought, you know, what kind of testimony is that going to leave? This guy's never going to be, he's never going to want to hear anything from me again, number one. But number two, as we go through life and we get a little bit of, of uh, more elder thinking, and, and once again, you say, well, what do you mean more elder thinking? If you remember when they brought the lady in adultery to Jesus, and Jesus picked up a stone, and he says, hey, he who is without sin, step forward, and I want you to cast the first stone. And if you really stop and think about this, it, it goes on and, and, and it reads this way, that from the eldest to the youngest, people just kind of wandered off. Because when they started thinking about it, they all knew that they were sinners. See? So I have no right, no matter what I've done, no matter what you think I've done, no matter what I might do today, all right, or tomorrow, I really have no right to criticize you, and you really have no right to criticize me. Now, let's say one of us did something that was completely, you know, anti-Bible or something. I shouldn't come on here and say, well, Maureen, what were you thinking? Biff Yeager, I can't believe you would do that. And, and then I would hope you all would not do the same thing to me, which I'm not saying it's impossible to hurt my feelings, <laughs> but I mean, you can try it if you want, I guess. But, you know, I might get mad, you know, you might see my face get red. But if somebody were to post something on here today, well, Brooke Lunsford, you know, 
what you taught was absolutely wrong and you know you're going to be damned in hell for what you just did and I'm, i'd be like whoa it's you know you know I, maybe it hurts my feelings maybe it doesn't you know i don't know but what i'm saying is there's ways to go to each other and if we need to go to each other and say hey you know what this here is something you probably want to avoid or do or whatever. So anyway, that's my thought. David White, it's great to see you this morning. So it's unwilling that any would perish. That's where we're at. Second Peter chapter three. So Peter is, once again, he opened this thing up with, I want you to remember some things. Then by the time he gets to verse three, he goes, let me tell you what's coming. The last days, there's going to be scoffers, and these people are going to make fun. They're going to mock the Christian. They're going to mock Jesus, and guess what? They did that when they arrested Jesus. They blindfolded Jesus and smacked Jesus and said, tell me which one of us smacked you. Can you imagine what that person's going through right now for smacking the Son of God? See, we get in the crowd sometimes, and we get, what do they call that, the a right mentality, I think is what it's called. And we really don't stop and think this thing through, right? So if you're mocking God, now how would I be mocking God today? Well, maybe I'm trying to teach a lesson and I tell you, you all shouldn't be doing this. And by noon today, you see me doing something that I told you not to do, right? Then in a way, I'm mocking God. When the devil tempted Jesus with the three things there in the wilderness, right? One of them was, I'll give you kingdoms of the world. One of them was, hey, if you're really the son of God, turn this stone into bread. And each time Jesus said, you know, thou shalt not, you know, uh, tempt the Lord thy God. That's the one I was getting to, which was next, because the third temptation was, and I may have them out of order, but the devil said, well, listen, you're the son of God, and it's written in the Bible that you could throw yourself off this high cliff, and the, and the angels would grab you before you hit the bottom. And Jesus said, it's not good to tempt the Lord thy God. See, when I mock God, I'm tempting God. When I take God's name in vain, whether I say the big GD word or I go with, a, with an acronym OMG, right? I'm still taking God's name in vain. That's still a real problem in society today. Our language and, and the way we act and the things we say and all these things, you know, and, and they make fun of somebody that wants to try to do the right thing. And it's not going to get better, okay? So, they're scoffers <clears throat> walking after their own lusts. So, they're walking after the things in this world. They're making fun of God. They're making fun of eternal life. And yet, they're selling every possession they own for that cup of soup. You know what I mean? They're selling out every possibility for eternal life to have a temporary worldly success that's going to pass away. That's pretty crazy. If you stop and think about that for just a few minutes, it is pretty heartbreaking. Why are they doing this? Oh, my gracious, I can't believe people would do this. Well, they're doing this because they have not been told. See, we're into second, third generation of people that have never been to church. They have no idea why everybody goes to church on Sunday, right? So we have to, we have to be mindful of that. And saying what? Where is the promise of his coming? This is what the scoffers and the mockers of God are going to say. Where is the promise of Jesus coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So once again, do we have these people today? Is everybody thinking that they've got time to get into the kingdom of heaven? Does everybody want to go to the kingdom of heaven? Absolutely. Everybody wants it. But nobody wants to check out the facts of what it takes to get to this thing called eternal life. Now, once you and I got it, what did we do? We we're like, oh, my gracious, I can't believe this. I wish I'd have gotten saved earlier. I so wish I'd have got saved 20 years. I can't tell you the mistakes that I would have avoided if I would got saved when I was 10 years old. It's, just, it's, it's amazing. In fact, I've written a little book about it. I've written some notes down, right? It's astounding all the things that I could have avoided, right? And I don't reveal them today uh, partly because I'm ashamed, right? But the other thing is, you know, you got family, you got relatives, you got people, you know, and they don't want to hear your dirty laundry and they don't want to hear, you know, what, what a maniac you are, Right? We don't want to embarrass anybody, but at the same time, part of my original testimony 
that I get to share with people when you're visiting with them is how God saved you. What did God do for you? When did you surrender to the Lord? And those times are when there's nowhere else to go. You're at the bottom of the barrel, you're on your back and you're looking up and you're like, man, I really need the Lord. I really need the Lord. And that's where we're at today. All right, so there's the promise, the promise of his coming. And grandma, I told you what grandma said. He's a lot closer today than he was yesterday. She loved to say that, right? People better be a getting in. That was her next statement, right? So think about those things. For this, they willingly are ignorant. See, the world is willingly ignorant. Everybody knows death is coming because everybody has died. Except Elijah and Enoch, everybody has seen death. There will be a group of people who do not see death, and those are going to be the people that are dead in Christ. See, they'll come out of the grave first, but then those that are walking around at the time that are alive at the tribulation period, they will not see death. And that's why, as we talked about a couple days ago, the transfiguration, that's why you have Jesus at the Mount of Transfiguration with Moses who had seen death and Elijah who was translated out of here and did not see death. So, From the beginning of creation, people said, look, it's always been evil. It's going to be evil. You know, I I know God loves everybody, so I don't have to make a choice for Jesus because he's going to love me and he's going to save me someday. Very dangerous, very dangerous situation. For this, they willingly are ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water whereby the world that was then was being overflowed with water, it perished. Talking about the time of Noah, how come the world, how come the world perished? How come the world uh, ceased to exist? Because they did evil continuously in the eyes of the Lord. God had not set up human government yet, right? Everybody was just kind of doing whatever they did. What they chose to do because sin had entered into the world through Adam and Eve and Noah was the eighth man, from God. Now think about this. Noah is the eighth man from God. And that's why Noah makes the new beginning because eight is a new start in the Bible. So think about this. In this first eight people, and once again, they a lot of people suspect that when people had children at this time, they might have had them like a litter of puppies like we see today, right? Might have been multiple childbirths at a time. Nobody knows that for, for example, but if there's only eight people, right? If he's the eighth one, right, that came from God, now he lived 950 years, right? But there was a lot of people that were were clawing at the side of that ark when God shut the door on the ark, right? So Peter is saying, look, whereby the world that was then was flooded, and that's what happened, right? But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, they're kept in store, they're reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So what's going to happen? This world is going to burn. I don't care how much climate control. I don't care if you never burn another ton of coal or if you turn off all the gas to everybody's house. This world is still going to burn up, okay? And it's going to burn up because that's what you do with trash. And this world of ungodly people is a world of trash. The people that escape being burned up are those that are going to be dead in Christ that rise first, or the dead in Christ will rise first. Those walking around are caught up to meet the Lord, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So we're gone. We're out of here, right? Now, all the people that are alive during this time, and once again, those that are going to be raised for that second death are going to meet the judgment of God in an ungodly way. And then whether it's whether they're burned alive on this earth or whatever happens, the, the, you know, they're going to burn eternally in a place called hell. Hell is a literal place. If you'll go to Luke 16, verse 19, I read that all the time to us because it's a letter straight from hell. And because, listen, I would have been there. If I'd have died before age 30, I would have been in hell. And I could have never looked at God in hell and said, God, why'd you let this happen? God, why'd you do this? Because I knew enough to be saved. But what we're getting into here and what we're learning, people are willfully ignorant. Oh, I got time. I'm going to get out here and have some fun. I'm going to sow my my wild oats. I'm going to get out here 
and I'm going to get a divorce because, you know, I, we can't get along anymore. I'm going to find me a better wife. Well, you might want to go slow on that, right? But anyway, that's, I'm not a marriage counselor, so I'm going to move forward. Um, but that's where we're at in this thing. So here we go. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promised them liberty, liberty, they call themselves the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same, is he brought into bondage? See, when I was in sin, I was a slave to the sin. See, Jesus frees us from that sin. That's pretty strong, right? Jesus frees us from the sin. Stop and think about that for a second. Jesus frees us from the sin. Pretty good stuff, isn't it? So those that are going through life mocking God, making fun of God, well, you Christians are a bunch of weak people. You Christians, ah, you are the biggest hypocrites. Ah, you Christians, if you're going to heaven, everybody's going to heaven. The devil's thrilled to death at those people doing stupid stuff. But they're fools. Because we're holding a book here with 2,000 pages in it. I'm past 2,000 pages in this book. And this book tells me how to have eternal life and know that I have it. But a lot of people won't even open the book. You guys know I'm doing a little school teaching to try to help these kids because they can't get a certified math teacher. And, you know, we we look at all these, all oh, the kids can't learn and the kids can't do this. Well, there's a math app application. It's a math app called Photo Math. Just a quick story. That photo math, you can take a picture of a problem. This is how far technology has come. You can take a picture of the problem. The, the app will solve the problem and give you every step in that problem. Every school in the country should be using this. You should never have, a, you should never whine about not having a certified math teacher ever again because right there it is. Step by step, right? And still, believe it or not, I have kids that won't write down the steps, have write it on the board, and they won't do it. Now, what is going on? Now, a lot of people blame it on COVID. COVID may be one of the greatest things the devil's ever done because COVID's got everybody fighting against everybody. It's got the Democrats in a fever against the Republicans. The Republicans are mad at the Dem I mean, everything is at a fever pitch. Everybody's mad and mad and mad. And then social media makes it easier and easier because I can mouth off to you, Biff, because you're in Wellington, Ohio. I can mouth off to Stephanie Barker. She's in Pensacola, Florida. See, we can mouth off to somebody that's not going to walk up to us in school this morning and whack us in the nose. See, but there's a reason that you had law and order and see, we're, we're getting away from that. It's pretty scary. Okay. For if they, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and savior, Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and they overcome the latter and is worse with them than from the beginning. So Peter says, look, here's what's crazy about getting tangled back up in the world as a false teacher. You came to the Lord Jesus Christ and you got saved, but you got entangled in the things of the world like the megachurch preacher because you started saying, just come to church. Oh, it's a workshop for sinner. Come on in. It doesn't matter about your adultery. It doesn't matter how many times you've been divorced. It doesn't matter about your addiction. It doesn't matter that you're exploiting the workers in the company that you own. Just come and hear the message. Now just come and give. Come and give. Give because we got to do the mission work. Give because the preacher needs paid. Give because the piano player needs paid. Give because we need somebody to manage everything. Give because the greeters need a few bucks. And then those people get up and say, well, why'd you miss on Sunday? Where were you people at? Y'all gonna go to hell if you don't go to church. And it's like, well, you're, it's a little easier to get motivated to go somewhere if they're paying you, right? I mean, let's be honest. But I say all that to tell you this is a real problem. The false teachers was a real problem. Peter preaching this and teaching this and writing this 33 years after Jesus has left the earth. So in the last 2,000 years, it hasn't gotten better. There aren't less false teachers. And the reason there aren't less is because time is getting closer. 
And the devil wants to take as many with him as he can take. Pretty scary stuff, isn't it? So, uh, let's see, where did I go? I don't know. I might have even gone backwards here. I stir you up, Lord, uh, people. Uh, there's going to be mockers. There's going to be scoffers. Uh, for they willingly are ignorant of that, the word of God, whereby the world being flooded. I've got that. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. This is the third chapter, verse nine. Now, what does this mean? The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Well, the reason for that is that he is long suffering. And I am so thankful to God that Jesus was long suffering because I had enough head knowledge to get saved when I was 10 12, 15, 18, 20, 25, 26, 27, you get the point, right? But God could have said, I'm striking you down. Um, uh, I'm striking you down because of your sin, right? That's what could have happened. And so since we're about out of time, let me address Terry's thing. Did everybody live longer? Noah lived 950 years, okay? It's in the Bible there in Genesis that Noah lived 950 years, Um uh, Adam, I think, lived somewhere in the 900s. Methuselah, which might have been a grandson of Noah. I'd have to go back and look at that. But he lived the longest of anybody, 969 years. Because remember this, you know, we get on God and say, God, why did you let this happen? But it was God's intention that we would live forever, right? Because that's what happened with Adam and Eve. They were going to live with it forever if they would have not sinned. But God also knew that even though he didn't want them to sin, and even though he wished they hadn't sinned, he still created, he's, God's always doing his part. So God created Adam and Eve to live forever. And I believe that's why you get those first five or six, or, or Noah was the eighth man from God, it says in the Bible. I believe that's why Noah lived 950 years, right? And sometimes as Christians, we get frustrated because people won't listen. But think about Noah. Before he got on the ark, Noah preached 120 years and nobody responded to the preaching. So it's not that you and I have a, a quota to meet. You know, I got to go out here and talk to 50 people and 10 people got to get saved. I don't have that quota to meet, right? My job is to talk about Jesus and, and maybe I plant a seed in somebody's mind. You know, maybe somebody else comes along and says something else about Jesus and, and, and it waters that seed a little bit, but it's only God that can convict the heart and save the soul, right? So yes, to answer, make a long story short, Terry, they did live longer, and then there was a period of time there where God promised them 120 years, right? So then it dropped back to 120 years. Then I think there's another section there where it dropped back to 70 years, Right? I'd have to look those verses up, but you could probably Google that. Um, you know, number one, I know how long Methuselah it was nine sixty nine. Noah was nine fifty. So yes, they did start out because once again, when the sin enters into the world, it wasn't all over the place because there was only Adam and Eve in the beginning, right? So it takes a little while for the sin cursed world to create. Now, the death was immediate. Death, in some respects, is separation from God. That was one death. That's a spiritual death and a sin nature that we inherited. But the other thing is when God made you to last forever, you see, it took a while for that to happen, you know, to wear down, I guess you would say, to wear out that body. Plus, you got to look at something else that we don't ever think about. They didn't have the printing press in Adam and Eve's day, but Adam was smart enough to name, or, you know, to name all the animals of the ocean, the air, uh, and on the land. So Adam was not stupid, okay? We think, well, we'd have never done that if we'd have been Adam, but we'd have done everything Adam did, right? Because we would have had no other choice because we inherited the very same sin nature that he actually contracted, I guess you'd say, or contacted. So it's still the same thing. All right, I got to roll out of here, but good question on that. Um, but I'll try to look that up as far as, I know it was... Um, you know, people lived the, the eight, nine hundred years there in the beginning. Um, and then it was, I want to say it was cut back to 120 and then it was cut back to 70. So, um, and today, but with all the artificial medicine and all the different things, you know, they can keep some people. It's amazing how they can keep some people alive. They can be right on death's door. I've been down there at the hospital 
and people have been, you know, we're calling Heck Funeral Home to come and get them. And, you know, they get in there and get them some steroids and get them shot up with some stuff and people come out of it and go back to living a normal life. So, you know, the body's an amazing thing, you know, it can bounce back uh, even as bad as we've polluted it and poisoned it sometimes. So anyway, uh, one day you're going to have a glorified body and you're going to move like Jesus moved. And if you think about how Jesus moved, everybody was standing there watching Jesus as he ascended to heaven. And the angel said, why are you sitting here looking at Jesus going up like that? Because the same way that he goes up, he's coming back. See, Jesus coming back for you. We got this thing one. Don't be discouraged by the things of the world. Ah, oh, we're going to be discouraged that our family and our friends and our enemies don't want to hear it, right? But just keep living it in front of them. If you can't talk to your family and your friends about Jesus, just keep living it in front of them, and it'll all start to make sense. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. We'll see you Monday. Lord, we're thankful. Thankful you've put this Bible together the way that you have. Thankful that we can read it and we can understand it. And man, what a wonderful thing it is. Lord, there's so many great things that you've done for us. And we are willfully ignorant on so many things that we just don't know or that we're too lazy to investigate. But the promises of God that you've made us are real. And we need to get into this Bible and learn about the, the, the old gospel hymn stands out to me. Standing on the promises of God, I cannot fall. And that's what we need to do today because we live in a crazy day and time. We've seen, there's things I never dreamed it could get so bad so fast. And uh, it is exactly a day when people mock God. Our politicians in, in 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, they may have hated Jesus as bad as some of them do now, but they would have never publicly said it because the majority of the people would have said, whoa, man, we don't want them criminals in there. But it's open, it's brazen, and people have lost their minds. So, Lord, we ask you to convict the heart, bring them back, draw them back, get them recommitted if they've got entangled in the things of the world, and bring them back into your family and into your service. Lord, always be with our prayer list, prayer, prayer, prayer list with our men and women soldiers at the top of the list. Please be with our veterans that have already served as wonderful men and women that, that accepted the call and went all over the world. And maybe they've suffered in some great way and they need help. We need to help them. Maybe they need a job or a door open to help get some training to get a job. Let's get that door open. Let's get them helped and trained. Lord, again, there's so many prayer requests. We got to have respect for our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responders. We thank you for these heroes, these men and women that go out every single day on the front lines of our problems here in the United States. We ask for you to be with our school kids. Man, they're struggling. And our teachers and bus drivers can't get enough of either. And Lord, be with the school system because the way it trickles down from the federal government, it's as broken as a dog's hind leg. We need some help. We need drastic intervention. So Lord, we're praying for you. We ask everybody that's on here to pray for our prayer list and our schools probably should be right there near the top. So think about our schools. Think about our hospitals. Think about our staffing at the hospitals because once again, a lot of burnout happened during COVID and COVID's kind of come back around. It's not as intense, but it's still an aggravation. The protocols still put people off work. It still alters work schedules. And, you know, when you're talking about 12 and 14 hour work days, it's still very hard on the whole staff. So, Lord, I hope and pray that you'll give the medical community a break, whether it's a hospital, a nursing home or a clinic. They really need a deep breath right now and all that they do. Lord, we thank you for your Bible. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for the fact we're sitting here. We're not just waiting on the front porch for you. We're doing some work for you. But we can't wait to see you face to face in a place like heaven where the day will never end and no more tears, no more sorrow, and no more pain will be there. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. That's what the song says. Cannot wait to see you. Lord, take us all now. We're tired of this. We're tired of the aggravation of the world. But we know you've left us here to tell the lost world that there's still an opportunity to meet you. And that's what we want to be doing. Lord, forgive us where we fail you and we'll give you praise, honor, and glory for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. We love you guys. We appreciate you guys so much. Man, if I can help you in any way, let me know. I'll do what I can. Hope you have the best weekend, and we hope to see you Monday morning. See you soon.